Welcome to Vinyasa in Verse, the podcast where we connect mind, body, and spirit through poetry and practice. I'm Leslie Ann Hobayan. Together, we'll explore different ways of connecting with our innermost selves and how to tap into the flow of the universe. Because once that happens, anything is possible. Your best life starts now. Hello, loves. Welcome to another episode of Vinyasa in Verse. How are you on this beautiful day? I hope wherever you are, you're able to take a moment to enjoy beauty around you, no matter how small it might be. But don't forget, there are also big moments. I know every episode I talk about, look at the small things, but also look at the big things, you know, look at the big tree in your yard and think about how many years it has grown to become the height that it's at, the magnificence that it holds and to think about all the roots underneath the earth for me that's beautiful um so yeah big and small now i've got a a new situation here um i'm trying a new method of recording this podcast uh i will say that my microphone stand the little one just like broke off so now i had to get this scissor arm thing and now i've got the mic here and i feel really cool like i'm in a recording studio or whatever it is um so it's fun 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 okay so today we're going to talk a little bit about something but first <laughs> we are going to turn to hafez to guide us in opening this episode so here we are with our roulette of poems Ooh, and today's poem is called God's Bucket. God's Bucket. This is by Hafez, the great Sufi mystic poet. If this world was not held in God's bucket, how could an ocean stand upside down on its head and never lose a drop? If your life was not contained in God's cup, how could you be so brave and laugh, dance in the face of death? Hafez, there is a private chamber in the soul that knows a great secret of which no tongue can speak. Your existence, my dear, O oh love, my dear, has been sealed and marked, too sacred, too sacred by the beloved, to ever end. Indeed, God has written a thousand promises all over your heart that say, life, life, life is far too sacred to ever end. Hmm. All right, so there's a lot here. And I already came to the show with a topic in mind. And I was looking at this and hearing this poem and reading it and wondering how this can guide us towards this subject that I have in mind. So what I wanna talk about today is um, self-doubt and how that plays a role in who we are and who we're being and our confidence levels and all those kinds of things. And what's interesting about this poem is, you know, Hafez is asking these questions. If God was not held in God's, if this world was not held in God's bucket, how could an ocean stand upside down on its head and never lose a drop? Which is to say, for me, what I'm envisioning is the earth rotating, you know, on its, spinning on its axis, rotating around the sun and the ocean isn't spilling out all over space, right? <laughs> um, and then he said, if your life was not contained in God's cup, how could you be so brave and laugh and dance in the face of death? So when you allow yourself to be held by God, you're able to do all the things without fear. You can laugh in the face of death because you know that God has you. You know that this life is not the end all be all that you as a spirit soul in this human body container continues on after the body has done its job, has expired, has died. So death is not um, the end all be all. It is a close to a chapter of a larger book that has no end. At least that's how I like to see it. Um, And what I appreciate is there is this part of you, the essence of you, the satnam, as I've said in past episodes, the truth of who you are, the essence is marked and sealed by this word too sacred, 
So you are so divine. You are too sacred to ever end. You are infinite as the divine is infinite. Um, and indeed, God has written a thousand promises all over your heart. Let's say life is too sacred to end. So your essence, the 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 Atma, as it's called in um, the yogic philosophies, is eternal. It is unchanging. And what happens is that, you know, scientifically, they know already that energy never dies, right? It just changes form. And so if you think about that, okay, from a scientific level, if energy never dies and our spirits, our souls, who we are at essence is energy, when we die, where does that soul go? Where does, where does that energy go? And it depends on who you ask, but I sense that it, it goes to another plane. It goes to another plane of existence. You know, we're talking, we've got the 3D existence. This is the, the existence that's tangible that we can access with our five senses. But then there's, you know, the fourth dimension, which is time and the fifth dimension, which is more of the spiritual plane. And so what I believe happens is that our, when we die, our souls go somewhere else probably like to some spiritual realm only to come back again <laughs> to say, Hey, all right, I did my thing on that planet as Leslie Ann. We learned some lessons. We evolved a little bit, but I still got more to learn. So I'm going to go back down and be a human being again and take on another form. Um, and so the energy comes back. And so the physical body, if you think about it, when the physical body dies, it, also transforms. So if you are in the practice of burying the dead, right, the body decomposes and just goes back into the earth. That energy goes back into the earth and the earth, mother earth transmutes that energy into nourishment for all the living beings underneath. But then that cycles through and becomes, you know, the, the whole cycle of life, the whole circle of life. So all this to say that our human experience is just that, right? It's an experience. And it's so easy for us to get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, into the stuff that the ego cares about, you know? Um, you know, one of the things that ego does is keeps us safe, right? And when there is perceived danger, our subconscious kicks in and our ego kicks in. We're like, whoa, no, we're not going to do that because we want to stay safe. We want to stay alive and not die. <laughs> and we're going to do what we can to stay safe. And what happens, what that looks like for a lot of folks is you end up living small. You play it safe. You live small. You say, all right, I'm just going to do these little things and just quote unquote get by. A lot of people... Um, you know, you say, Hey, how you doing? Ah, oh, fine. Getting by surviving. You know, that those are some answers that I've heard from a lot of folks. And I know that that's sort of a, a throwaway answer. That's like the automatic answer where people don't really want to get into however it is they're actually doing. But there are so many other throwaway responses you can use. You can be like, Oh, I'm great. Or, you know, things are cool without getting too involved in it with also, I mean, and not lying, you know, because things could be cool, even while also dealing with hardship and challenges. So um, this idea of survival is an indication of how one is living their, their life on this planet in this moment in time. And I feel like that's not really the lesson that we're here to learn. Um, that our life's purpose isn't just to survive, just to be here. I feel that we are meant, each of us are meant for something bigger and something specific just for us. You know, so for example, my dear friend Ross, who is um, a guest on a past episode, I can't remember the episode number, but just, you know, look through the episodes and you'll see Ross Gay, and he is um, an amazing human being, a beautiful person, always full of gratitude and generous with his love and his time, all the things. And I feel that his purpose 
is to do that, is to be him and to just spread love and teach people gratitude and show people how amazing it is to garden and be in communion with the plants, to have a really loving relationship with the earth um, while also navigating this space of this country as a black man um, and what that looks like for him. And he's just like such an example to behold, <laughs> which is funny because his newest book is called Be Held. Um, but to use him as an example of someone who's following his life's purpose. Now, if you asked him, you know, are you following your life's purpose? He'd be like, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> you know, he's just tapped in and he just goes with the flow. But for a lot of us, we are given this, what I call the plan, capital T, capital P, where we go through the school system. We are told after we graduate from high school, we enter college or maybe a trade school if you're, if you're guided that way. Um, then you go get a job, whatever that might be. And then you find a partner you go marry that partner, you have kids, grow a family, continue to work. And if you're lucky, stay in good health so that you can retire and then travel and or do whatever you want to do, you know, the things that you want to do if you weren't working. And I'm like, is that really your life's purpose? I don't think so. You know, I mean, maybe that is for some people, but not for most. So we're given these messages, right? We're given these messages of here's what you're supposed to do. Here's what you should do. Here is how to succeed, quote unquote, succeed, because everyone has a different definition of success. But living in a capitalist country, success looks like earning a lot of money at a job, um, even if you're miserable, even if you're working 80 hours a week, which is insane, by the way. Uh, so we're given these messages, right? And if you don't achieve these things, if you don't tick off these boxes, then you're a failure. You're not pursuing the best that there is. You're not pursuing happiness, all kinds of things. And so there's this expectation of us to excel and accomplish a certain thing by a certain time, according to somebody else. And so when those messages are given to us at an early age, which they often are, if not all the time, and when I say early age, I'm talking from birth to age seven, which is when your subconscious gets formed, your, your belief system gets formed. When we are born and up until age seven, our subconsciouses are sponges. We just, we're just walking subconsciouses, basically. <laughs> There's no filter. You know how you, you always hear kids where they're just like talking and saying the things that you wish you could say and they just say it? It's that. If there's no filters, no nothing. They just say how they, they see it. They call it how they see it. They absorb what they're told. They don't question anything. Everything's at face value. It's like, oh, that's what I need to do. Okay, I'm going to go do it. And so these become the foundation of our beliefs where when we're adults, if what we're doing doesn't match up with those beliefs, we are in a struggle where we, we become, we create inner conflict, you know? So let's say our life's purpose is to serve others by teaching yoga. Okay. We'll just, we'll just say that. I mean, that's cause that's something I know. I don't know. I don't know or think that that's my own life purpose. Um, but we're just going to use that as an example. So let's say you're a little kid, you're like three years old and someone says, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a yoga teacher. And somebody's like, mm, yoga teachers don't make money. So that's nice and all, but maybe you shouldn't do that. That's, that's cute. But when you get older, you're going to understand the real world and you're going to need to get a real job. And I, you know, all these were real in quotes, air quotes, right? So then we get older, we do our things that we need to do in order to be perceived as somebody who is successful and moving along the, the path, right? And we still have this calling to be a yoga teacher, right? 
We've done all the things. We go to high school. We go to college. We major in business. We're not exactly sure what business means, but we major in business. And because we like to express ourselves, we think that marketing is a good area in business to go into because there is some creative writing that happens there. There's some expression there. We don't see the big picture. We don't know that marketing actually means you need to shape language and concepts and images to fit the mission of the business that you're working for. So it's not really your expression, <laughs> right? But you just see expression. You're like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go do that because that's, that's so something I think I can do. Um, but you're still feeling this call to be a yoga teacher. So you do the job, you find a job with some company as a marketing person and you're in the job and then you're finding out the hard way that, yeah, this is not really my thing, but this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what people told me I should do. Here we go with the should, right? And I'm not happy, but I'm making decent money, I think, and I'm just gonna keep going. So then you go along this path and you still can't ignore that tug to be a yoga teacher. It's constantly tugging you. There are signs everywhere. It's like, me, a yoga teacher. I mean, not literal signs. Maybe it's literal signs, but it's this tug that indicates to you you can't ignore it anymore, right? So you finally break down. You go, hey, I'm going to go to yoga teacher training. I want to, you know, study yoga. I'm going to be a yoga teacher like I've always wanted to since I was three, even though I'm going to keep the marketing job because that's the quote unquote real job. This yoga teacher thing, that's just a side thing. That's just, you know, something I do for fun. So, the, so then you go do that, right? You go and get, you go immerse yourself in some amazing uh, training. You realize that yoga teacher training isn't just about teaching you how to teach yoga. It is about experiencing what it is to embody all eight limbs of yoga. So your life has changed. You're like, oh my God, that's what this is. Whoa, I can't believe it. Right. And then so you're like, maybe this yoga teacher thing is something I got to do. But then you go to teach your first class and then the self doubt comes in. And then you're like, wait a minute. I don't think I can do this. There's no way. I don't know anything about yoga. I'm like total. No, mm -mm. you know, people told me that it was just a pipe dream and it's not a real job. And you know, like, who am I to be teaching yoga? I'm not even Indian, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's these stories that we tell ourselves, right? And the stories that we tell ourselves are the stories that people fed us when we were little. And so now they come back to us again, they cycle back in. And then you're like trying to do this thing of like teaching yoga, because you know, deep down in your heart that this is what you've been called to do, that you want to serve other people by showing them how yoga can positively impact their lives, right? But you've got this voice. So you're standing. So let's just say one of your one of your teachers from training is like, "Hey, uh, so and so just called out, and I I need a sub. Can you do it?" And you want to do it so bad, but you're also freaking out because you've never taught a class before. Although I will say, yoga teacher training programs usually have their trainees. Um, teach community classes. So there isn't that kind of pressure, but even so let's say, all right, community class, you know, the person scheduled for the community class, they caught, they got sick. Can you fill in? And you're like, Oh my God. Oh, really? Ah, mm. So you're going through these feelings of, yes, I so want to do it. I totally want to teach this. And then the other side of that spectrum is, Oh my God, I don't think I can do it. It's like, there's no way it's scary. It's like, people are going to look at me. They're going to judge me. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to know that I don't know anything. And that's, the, that's the rub right there. It's because there are these stories that were planted early on that told you, you cannot do this thing, that this thing doesn't matter, that this thing doesn't count, quote unquote, count as something worth doing. And so all of these doubts start flooding in and you get paralyzed and you're like, oh man, what do I do? What do I do? Do I do it? Do I not do it? You know, and then there's this piece, right? Where a lot of folks in the, um, in the wellness industry and in the mindfulness industry, the spirituality, like all those, I mean, the fact that the word industry comes with it is, it's really sad and depressing to me, but 
I digress. So a lot of the messaging that we hear around fear is to just push through that fear. You know, one of the messages is like, feel the fear and do it anyway. Be afraid and do it anyway. And I have mixed feelings about that because I understand the concept behind it. You know, it's like you don't want fear to paralyze you and hold you back from living your life, the life that you're, you've are you been called to live, right? But at the same time, you don't want to kill your nervous system, <laughs> you know? I mean, our nervous system is there to protect us. Our ego is there to protect us. And when you try to override that protection system, then that becomes a problem. Then your body is like, what, what, wait, what, what's going on? I'm trying to keep us safe. And now you're overriding the system. This system's in place for a reason, girlfriend, like what? So to think about how do you look at your fear? How do you make friends with it? Yes, I said friends, make friends with your fear. Sounds crazy, I know, but it's possible make friends with your fear, get to know your fear intimately. And this is part of shadow work. You know, this is part of looking at the things that you don't necessarily want to look at about yourself. Right. But I'm not going to get into the shadow work here. We're going to just talk about fear and self doubt. So the fear is holding you in place. Ask yourself or ask fear, like, where are you coming from? How did you get here? Who birthed you? Who created you? You know, and and to assure your nervous system, we're safe. We're just asking for some questions, you know, and just kind of investigating. We're not going to just take the deep plunge just yet. And then once you identify that, you can identify the source, the root of your self-doubt. The self-doubt, you know, I mean, we all know it as imposter syndrome. And I talked about this on a previous episode. Imposter syndrome is just self-doubt, which stems from stories that were given to us, stories that we created in ourselves, all kinds of layers that are playing out behind the curtain in the grand scheme of the Wizard of Oz, you know, and it's funny that a lot of folks don't are not yet aware of how much goes on behind that curtain. You know, I've said in past episodes that 95% of our lives, our existence, our presence, our being is run by the subconscious. We think that, you know, because of our conscious minds and we're making choices here and there and it's like ego driven and whatever, that that is that we're in charge, consciously in charge, but we're not. <laughs> 95% is run by the subconscious. Now you can understand your subconscious. You can take the time to, to learn about it, to look back at your stories that have been given to you since birth and uproot them and take them out. But it takes awareness to even know that those exist. Often what happens is that the ego gets in the way. The ego is like, no, 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 we're not gonna look at that subconscious. No, let's pay attention here. I'm in charge. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> I mean, seriously, just watch Wizard of Oz again and think about like how the man behind the curtain is your subconscious. And then you get back to me and let me know what you, <laughs> how that's an appropriate metaphor. So the, the fear and the ego are best friends, you know, because the fear is here and the ego is like, oh, I see you fear. All right. So we're going to keep this person, this human being safe from you by staying in place. Thanks, fear. We're just going to we're just going to hover and be in our spot. But what happens is that no growth occurs, no forward movement occurs. 
no learning about oneself occurs. And is that the kind of life you want to live? You know, I have, um, I know, I know of a person who um, seems to be aware of healing and what that might look like and what that feels like. And this person has a sense of spiritual growth and evolution, but they are still wrapped up in their ego and they don't see it. And it's been interesting to witness um, just to kind of watch the, the, the struggle of the ego trying to hold on as the subconscious and the spirit itself is, is trying to break free. It's not a place I, uh, I am envious of at all. <laughs> but um, but I, I think about that in relationship to self-doubt and the imposter syndrome and how that is or feels like a protective measure, but it's really just, I hate to say it, but a cop-out. You know, it's a cop out because when you lower yourself because you're afraid, that's the easy way out, you know. But when you know deep down inside that you got this, that you own it, that you know whatever it is that you're doing. And you're like, hey, fear, can we be friends so I can just keep stepping forward? That is the secret. That's the magic. That's growth and evolution and an opening, an expansion of the self. So we got to get rid of imposter syndrome. We got to get rid of self-doubt. We discard it off to the side and hopefully <laughs> you can keep on moving, keep on trucking. Um, so I just wanted to presence imposter syndrome as something that we all experience, this, this self-doubt, this lack of confidence in what we know. Can we move into self-trust? Can we trust ourselves to move through the thing that we need to move through, to teach whatever we need to teach? Just going back to my example of that imaginary self of me, or that person, whoever I'm talking about, <laughs> the, the character that I created, during this recording, can can you, we'll pretend you are the character, listen to your listener, can you trust yourself to teach that yoga class, to trust in your training? Because yoga teacher training is no joke. I mean, that is something, for most programs, that is something really intense and often life-changing. And can you trust in that experience so that you can share that with others? Now, I know people are probably going to get wrapped up in the, well, I don't know how to cue, you know, how to move into downward facing dog. And I just tumble over my words and, you know, all of these 3D tangible, quote unquote, problems. They're not really problems. It's just part of the learning. It's just the learning curve, right? And how can you learn anything, truly learn anything until you try it, until you experiment, until you put it out there, you know? I mean, there are people who are stuck in place because they can't take the first step forward because they're still trying to plan everything to perfection before stepping out into the world with whatever they want to share. And that's hiding. You know, that is allowing imposter syndrome to take over your life. You are hiding by using this excuse of I'm not ready. It needs to be perfect. P.S. There's no such thing as perfect. But if you want to get something perfect, you need to put it out there so that you get feedback on what's working, what's not working. You can't figure out everything in your head. It's not possible. I've tried. And a lot of other people have tried. <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, if you want to prove me wrong, I invite you to do so. So come on in, reach out to me and let, let's have a conversation about that. So thinking about how can we move into self-trust? 
what needs to happen in order for us to really stand in our knowledge, in our power, and to move forward, to know that we got this. There's no such thing as imposter. What is the fear behind it? What is holding you back? Those are the questions to ask. Whew. All right, my friends. So there's a lot for you to chew on here. And I don't want to overwhelm you. So I'm going to wrap up the episode <laughs> with a tarot. Well, actually an oracle card. So I, I got these oracle cards um, in Sedona. It's called The Secret Language of Light. You see that? All right. So today... I just want to call forward a card that can help guide us through these moments of self-doubt, through these moments of imposter syndrome. And so how can we be guided through it? And so we've got this card here, color. Isn't this beautiful? Let's see, can I get it right? Okay, color. So let us see what the guidebook says for color. I'll hold up the cards so you can all gaze at it for those of you that are watching on YouTube. Here we go. Color. This card is for vibrational impulses and light waves. Your perception of life is becoming more colorful. You are opening to different colors and experiences. Color breaks up old black and white thinking and opens your heart to the beauty of life and love. The colors of the rainbow are variations of white light reflecting the diverse experiences of life and they are all valid. Each color of the spectrum has its own energy, energetic vibration that stimulates certain responses and healing. Different colors mirror your current physical, emotional, and spiritual state. Your soul uses this mirror to communicate your need to heal or to embrace balance. Get to know what colors you are attracted to and the ones that repel you. You are love and you are loved no matter how colorful your or another another's life is. Hmm. So this is a good card to think about how you are loved and held no matter what you do, no matter how badly you might fail, no matter how much you might not know, doesn't matter. What matters is that you're love, love, you are loved, but you also are love made manifest. And that is enough. It's freaking awesome. Okay. So that's it, my friends, for today. I will close the practice as I always do with practice episode. <laughs> I've been teaching yoga lately, can you tell? <laughs> the divine light in me bows to the divine light in you. Until next time, namaste.